good. Yep. Um, Looks like you're all coming through loud and clear. Excellent. Thank you very much. Are you ready to start? Uh, I'll get us underway now, yes. Thank you. Uh, right, so welcome everybody to the hearing subcommittee for dangerous dams, earthquake prone dams and flood prone dams. Um, we'll open with a karakia. Thank you, Hugh. Whakataka te hau ki te ura. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia ma kina kina ki uta. Kia ma taratara i kai ihe aki ane te atakura. E tio he huka te hau hu ti he mori ora. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, next up, we have the health and safety statement. I'll take that as read. Everyone's happy with that. Have no apologies. Yep. I'll move that and a second. Uh, thanks, Robbie. All those in favour? Aye. Opposed, so carried. Are there any disclosures of interest relating to the topics we have today? No. And those, again, sure. seconded. Thank you, Councillor Smith. All those in favour? No. Opposed, so carried. Uh, so we've got uh, myself, Warama, um chairing today. I'm also joined by Councillor Noel Smith and Councillor Robbie Cookson. We have a few staff in the room also. Um, so we will be going through. We've had a number of submissions come through and we have one submitter that is going to present to us online today. Uh, so I'll start with a just a brief staff summary. Thank you, Annika. Thank you. Um, Ko Annika Hamilton, Toko Ingwa. I'm a policy advisor in the policy implementation team. Um, also at the table today, I have Alejandro Zafuentes, um, Hugh Keane and Owen Smith and the team working on the policy. So the report you have in your agenda pack provides an overview of the legislative background to this policy. That's at paragraphs 12 to 19. Um, it also outlines the steps we have taken to carry out the special consultative procedure. This includes details about how we advertise the consultation and you can find that information at paragraphs 20 to 24 of the report. And the report provides an overview of the submissions we've received. Um, we've received five submissions in total. One submitter would like to be heard. Um, that submitter is Coromandel Watchdog of and Catherine Delahunty will be presenting online via Teams. Um, I also understand that the submitter has shared some information, supporting information that's been um, shared with you in advance by Democracy Services. Um, so after the hearing, deliberations are scheduled immediately following. Staff will remain in the room should you have any technical questions you would like assistance with. Um, but if the chair is happy for the report to be taken as read, I'll let you proceed to the hearing. Thank you very much. Yep, happy to take that as read. Um, so we'll get underway with the submission from the um, Coromandel Watchdog or Hiraki. And that's uh, coming to you, Catherine. Thank you. Oh, good, um, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just like to acknowledge um, that my dog is now barking, um, but I'd like to acknowledge the um, karakia because we've certainly needed over here on this side of the um, the Waikato Tainui um, Paraki the peaceful the peaceful um, dawn that it talks about in the karakia. And I also like to acknowledge Nati Wariri, Nati Mahanga, Nati Tama Nu. Nupo, Nati Korakia, Kahukura, and Nati Hawa as Mana Whenua of Kirikiri Roa, where you're situated. I'm here in the Nati Maru in the valley, the beautiful Kauranga Valley um, up behind Thames. So I'm speaking today um, for this group, Coromandel Watchdog of Hauraki, um, but I'm also bringing some of my experience as a former Member of Parliament on working on contaminated sites. So um, I worked at length um, under the key government with the Minister for the Environment, Nick Smith, on contaminated sites and on contaminated sites policies. So I'm, that's why I'm speaking on behalf of, 
uh, group, although this mission was put together by um, Mr. Martin Smith from Coatunian. So I'm not going to repeat what's in the submission, nor am I going to debate what's in and out of scope, because I appreciate that the staff um, were working within the frameworks they were given around the Building Act and the Contaminated Sites Policy. However, I think in the context to which we're operating, there's a few points that we would just like to make for your consideration in terms of the overall question of risk um, and how these both these two um, parts of the law do or don't address that. So having looked at first definitions, um, looking at the Building Act definitions around moderate risk of, of flooding and moderate risk of earthquake, um, we have to acknowledge that the game has changed. So we no longer, uh, the definitions of what's moderate and what's extreme um, are no longer simple. We, ha we have experienced, and as many of you know, what happened, say, for example, in Esk Valley or Kōpū Hekawai, tell us that rain events are no longer within what can be expected. So we need to be expecting the unexpected and defining what is moderate and what is a risk, depending on the modern context of climate chaos, unfortunately. Um, so we're not disputing that those that there needs to be definition under the Building Act or that it's not appropriate to look at it, but I think with the two points I'd like to make is flooding, uh, we really can't afford for the possibility. It's what we what they call in the RMA um, low probability. We're just what we're we're losing your audio, Catherine. We've lost your audio and you've frozen on the screen. It's frozen again and we cannot hear you. I wonder if you shut your video feed down, maybe the audio will come through better, possibly. Uh, sorry, I don't know what that was. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? Yes, we've got you back. Thank you very much. Um, technology being what it is. So um, where I was at was with the flooding, the points about places like what happened at Corporal Hekawai or at Esk Valley, where the bombs, imagining that those hit um, sites such as uh, the tailing dams at Waihe, um, we can't really deny that these are dangerous dams because these are earth dams. And although obviously um, we hope these things never happen, we have to design and future proof our policies for this region around the realistic change in the way that risk is assessed. So that's one of the issues. The other one is, and I'm not sure that this has been taken into account, and the reason I'm raising it is that contaminated sites policy nationally doesn't really address geophysical threats in detail. It's not really about geophysical threats. It's about um, rehabilitation, it's about leachate, it's about um, responsibility. It's not actually about geophysical threats. And so these geophysical threats, with the discovery of the Kirapehu Fault, which I'm sure you have been briefed on. So this Kirapehu Fault um, is a relatively new um, new piece of information, and the Horiki District Council ran a, an event um, a couple of years ago looking at it. Um, Waihe area and the dams there are within that framework. They're within the mod possible moderate effect of an earthquake that comes based at the Kirapehi Fault. Possibly a greater risk, however, of, in terms of earthquake is the is the is the plates off the um, Tairawhiti East Coast. So if those plates moved and there was a large earthquake at Gisborne, for example, or off um, to Araroa, that would affect Waihe and it would affect the Eastern Bay and it would affect us. So we just need to recognise that those dams weren't designed around climate chaos and they weren't, because I was there at the very first hearings for the Waihe mine, so I actually have lived through this issue. And so I think we really need to take into account that they weren't designed around climate change and they weren't designed around the fact that the Kirapehi Fault, for example, even existed. 
And we've had a lot of indications in recent years that the disasters that we say are one in 100 are actually not. They're going to be regular and they can, of course, if earthquake, we can never predict. So I just want you to bear those in mind and bear in mind that liability consent, consenting these structures has happened and the liability and cost will end up on the rate pairs of this region and they will be questions asked to the WRC about what um, long-term planning and policy have you developed to take them into account. So getting on to the issue of contaminated sites, now the real cost, the real cost of cleaning up any um, um, tailings dams and dangerous dams that actually collapse these days is very different from what it used to be. And so I was involved with the Te Aroha issue when I was in Parliament. It cost $20 million and you guys also kicked in. And it was a tiny concrete um, um, covering a tiny concrete area with concrete and it was liming a couple of creeks. It cost us $20 million. Anything goes wrong at those tailing, tailings dam, any denial that they create risk actually leads to the fact that we're underestimating costs. The bonds that cover those structures are not, you might say they're not under the Building Act, they're under another policy, but if you don't make the connections between these two things, we have a problem because the bonds that are supposedly going to rehabilitate any um, damage at Waihi, 60 million bucks is a drop in the bucket. It's only three times what we spent on Te Araha some years ago. And these structures are vast. And I'm not sure how many of you have seen them. But especially from the air, you realise what we're dealing with. And liqu liquefaction is a real risk under earthquake um, or weather bomb pressures. So these bonds are not adequate. The costs return to the community and the regional council and the district council if anything goes wrong. So we just wanted to make those points because once, and I don't know how much you know, you probably know a bit about this, but once the Waihi mines supposedly are closed satisfactorily, they can uplift the bond and it is no longer there. It is the weight on the Martha Trust, which is a mysterious body that no one will talk to us about. And I've tried to talk to Hauraki District because they're supposed to be in charge of this. So there is a real sense of when, when the mine closes, the mining company will go. They will take that 60 million if that's what it is at the time. There's, there's no guarantee. There's a thing called a capitalization bond, which is only 10 million. So I just want you to recognize that moderate under the building act these definitions need to take account of modern risk and and the final point i'd like to make because i'm sure i'm out of time is that um i sent you the paper because 20th first century tailings dams are failing if you do a risk assessment based on the next 20 years they're not if you do a risk assessment based on the next 200 there's almost a hundred percent failure of earth dams around the world so actually we have to wake up to what is modern risk assessment and not apply just hopeful figures around the next 20 years and inadequate bonds. If TUI cost 20 million, I can't even imagine how many billion it would cost if there was any collapse of those dams at Waihi, which are adjacent to the Ohunimuri River, and the Ohunimuri River goes straight into Tikapu Moana, of the Hauraki Gulf. So that's why we're concerned, because we know there's another huge one about to be built, So, um, which we've been active involved in. And we, I really appreciate your time and that it's a leap of faith to go from the Building Act to the Contaminated Sites Policy, but both of them need to be connected and they need to be modern and they need to acknowledge these very real potential threats, which aren't going to happen tomorrow necessarily, but there is, there, as I said, low probability, high consequence. Thank you very much for listening to my um, submission. Thank you for submitting, um, Catherine, today. I just go to the other councillors. Do you have any questions? Good morning, Ray. Uh, Noel Smith speaking. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, you've said as these um, dams from around the world, I yep. look at the only New Zealand example, the Golden Cross. Yes. Uh, I, I think it's useful information, but for me, how do I draw the similarities? Um, because obviously under the RMA, uh, which I was a former commissioner, uh, there's no precedent and no sites the same. So you would accept that this is indicative that they have a habit of failing. Yes. But there's no guarantee that they will fail. I suppose it's an example. How much weight are you really wanting us to put on that? I'm asking you to consider that the world has changed. Therefore, the low risk environment that we have been in 
cannot be continue, considered to continue on that basis. Um, and if you look at some of those, they're in Western countries with so supposedly modern environmental licensing regimes. Also, unfortunately, the RMA at this moment, if you've got a, a tailings dam or a mine created under fast track, the RMA doesn't really apply. So it's going to be a very interesting. We don't know how that's going to look yet, but we are in a new a new ball game in so many ways. And I do appreciate your point that that White Cody cost thirty million for that company because it was built on a on a slip that kept moving. Tui cost twenty million on a tiny mine in the nineteen seventies. So that's not that long ago. And I really hope and pray this never happens here. But we do have considerable costs from contaminated sites around the country. And you look at the government's just put another six million into um, Fox River and Tokomari Bay, which are both relatively small. And yet some of the, the, the most large and potentially dangerous dams are in this region. So we need robust policy that takes this into account. And I appreciate your point and I appreciate your question. Uh, and another question, um, I formerly was in the uh, council at Waikato District and we had the state coal um, the carbonisation plant out there, uh, and of course, um, recently with state coal um, closing, we've got the escrow accounts for rehabilitation and so on. Is there any way in which you see that working in the circumstances that we face ourselves? I personally haven't been able to work it out that we can, but uh, is there anything that you would have comment on on that? <sighs> Well, not really. I mean, one of the things I did in Parliament was negotiate to set up a list called the Orphan Sites for, um, Contaminated Sites Fund, so that the current Contaminated Sites Fund is based on orphan sites, meaning ones where the companies have closed. And we did that because a large majority of some of the most toxic sites in the country have no company to hold to account. And so just, you know, hoping that the companies will pay has not worked in the past. And so I do think you're in a, that with that spot, what you have to do is lobby government hard to get some money for the cleanup so that it doesn't fall. That's why I set up the list and I wanted more than 10 sites per year to be paid for by the state rather than regional and local authority because I know how expensive this is. But in fact, they're only, um, well, what we manage to get is, is 10 sites a year. I mean, it can always change, but you just have to lobby hard that this is a major uh, site that needs that has been abandoned by the, um, particularly if it's state coal, then you can go to the state and say, well, you have an obligation. But it's already there that that site um, fund, the contaminated site fund exists. It's just like everything else, it's competing in cabinet. And so it's very hard to get the money. And I appreciate your problem. And I don't <laughs> want to see that. I don't want to see that happen to yeah. the people of the other side of the region over at Waihe. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate them. Thank you, Robbie. Any questions? Um, no, just observation more than anything. I, I, I actually grew up in Tierra, so I, 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 as a kid, I walked over the tailings mine several yeah. times. It's yeah. only the size of a, a rugby field at the most, and it had $20 yeah. million dollars to clean it up. Um, and out of what you've spoken about, most probably the, um, and we've all lived it in the, since 2018, being a farmer and Noel's the same, the weather events of um, those extremes of two or three hundred mils and events that not that they haven't happened, but most yeah. probably we're not value, valuing them as they they happen every 50 years or and we need to assess that more into this into the what we're going to evaluate here, I suppose. Is, and I, 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 you know, I've lived on a farm that's flooded three times in 18 and last year, so I totally understand where you're coming from, that we just most probably need to evaluate that a lot more than what we're assessing here at the moment. So thank you. Well, thank you for your comments, because I think with living on the land, you see the changes. And you're right, we've always had some quite extreme weather in the region. I've lived here since I was 17, I'm now 70. But what actually happens now is it's going to be more than 50. We know that. The science is pretty clear, and it puts a real burden on everybody trying to anticipate. I mean, I'm just grateful to have had a, a summer this year where we weren't hit by cyclones, mm -hmm. but the pattern is is becoming established and it's very concerning. So thank you for acknowledging that. And I just want the dangerous dams policy to be modernised to recognise what the councillor just said. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And, and yeah, just also a comment from myself. Uh, myself and councillor uh, Dunbar-Smith have uh, both been around the Waihe site um, in the past six months. Yep. So uh, very aware of uh, the, the scale of that operation and um, and, the, and where it sits there. So um, yes, once again, thank you for your submission.
and uh, we'll take that into account. And we do have all the uh, paperwork that was sent through to us by, by yep. the organisation. So thank you. They're international rather than local, but just remember Tui, remember Waitakoti, and remember the other toxic sites around the country. And remember the weather. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Have a good meeting. Yes, thank you, Catherine.